This video introduces the basis for precision frequency, phase and time reference clocks, as well as the concept of disciplining, in an effort to fill any voids in basic training for people who are coming into the synchronization and timing field. Especially now with 5G and other technologies requiring timing synchronization verification. We will cover basic concepts, oscillator types, frequency disciplining, 1 PPS phase alignment and how to configure the optional built-in atomic clock in VX test sets. If you are already familiar with the theory, you may skip to the last section, in which we show how to configure and perform the disciplining process with VX test sets. However, we encourage you to stay and listen to the whole talk and pass the link along to your colleagues, especially to those starting to learn sync. We will use simplified diagrams to explain the basic concepts, which should be valuable for anyone who is new to precision timing. There are two main types of network synchronization, frequency synchronization and time synchronization. Frequency synchronization was widely deployed in transport networks using time divisions multiplexing, like SDH and Sonnet, as well as in Synchi and CPRI links. The idea is that all network elements run at the same exact data rate, or an exact multiple of it. Time, timing or phase synchronization are used in modern networks to align multiple geographically distributed network elements. One big example are the 4G and 5G mobile networks using time division duplexing, in which having the same time helps in knowing exactly when devices can transmit to avoid collisions and errors, and maximize the use of the available bandwidth. Accurate frequency sources or references are required by modern communication technologies. Whether it is a 4G LTE advanced or 5G TDD cellular systems and their components, the power grid, stock trading, manufacturing, or autonomous cars, they all need precise synchronization in order to work well. In this context, precise means very accurate and stable. For example, a 1 ppm 10 MHz oscillator can output a frequency somewhere between 9,999,990 Hz and 10 million and 10 Hz, but there are ways to correct that. With regards to local frequency sources, equipment manufacturers select the best precision oscillator they can afford. But, affordability doesn't necessarily mean cheap or inexpensive. It means that it still meets all the requirements for the target application and environmental conditions, such as size, power consumption, accuracy, stability, robustness, and cost. For example, the best oven-based designs tend to be larger and consume more power. With the small footprint, power and cost constraints of miniature 5G cells or field test equipment that would not fit the target use case. The 1 PPS signal is used for time synchronization. Its pulses act like the pendulum for modern precision clocks. It is the constant tick-tock signal that makes seconds increment and whole systems work in unison. In terms of timing, the 1 PPS period is exactly the length of 1 second. From the time point of view, the rising edge of each pulse is aligned with the start of the standard second. A process called disciplining is used to align local 1 PPS pulses to the standard second and correct the oscillator's frequency, using reference signals from Global Navigation Satellite Systems or GNSS. Precision clocks are considered to be extremely accurate and stable. That is, they are reliable sources of frequency, timing and time. Synchronization is very important for modern communication systems. Without sync, equipment may not know when to transmit or when to listen. This becomes even more important in geographically dispersed infrastructures, such as cellular networks or the power grid. In the test and measurement field, we need accurate clock references in order to verify and qualify the accuracy and stability of recovered clocks from network elements. As synchronization moves from a centralized approach in main nodes, towards the edge of the network, having reliable, accurate and stable frequency, timing and time references in the field have become a critical requirement for portable test equipment. Let's take a quick look at some common types of oscillators and get familiar with terminology and acronyms. Let's start with the most common type of oscillator, the quartz crystal oscillator. On its own, it doesn't qualify as a precision frequency source, but it is an important building block for modern clocks. 
As mentioned earlier, a modern stratum 3 E quartz oscillator may have a typical specification of 10 MHz plus or minus 1 ppm at 20 degrees Celsius. That is somewhere between 9,999,990 Hz and 10 million and 10 Hz. That is a lot of uncertainty. To put this in perspective, from the time point of view, 1 ppm is equivalent to gaining or losing 1 microsecond every second. Which is not good. These days we prefer to see inaccuracies in the order of parts per trillion. One of the problems with quartz oscillators is that their frequency varies with changes in ambient temperature. We are not just talking about weather or room temperature, but the heat generated by the electronics from the system they are in and the fluctuations created by their cooling fans. If a temperature sensor is added, the manufacturer can design a controller that applies estimated corrections based on empirical data. Then it becomes a more predictable and stable temperature compensated crystal oscillator or TCXO. But wouldn't it be nice if the temperature around the oscillator doesn't change? To achieve that, a heating element is added to the oscillator enclosure, in an effort to keep the internal temperature as constant as possible. Then it becomes an oven-controlled crystal oscillator or OCXO. For example, let's say that an OCXO is designed to run at an ideal internal temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. If the environment temperature is 40 degrees, the controller applies a little bit of current to the heater in order to maintain the required 60 degrees. If the environment temperature is zero, the controller has to apply more power to the heater to make up for the difference and bring it to 60 degrees. The stable temperature around the quartz oscillator makes it even more accurate and stable. We could say that here is where the precision oscillator's line really starts. The downside from this design is that it can be power hungry, but that is a fair price to pay for improved accuracy and stability. We can make it even better if we replace crystal vibrations with atomic resonance. That is, use an atomic oscillator. Here the physics and diagram can get quite complicated. So, let's just say that atomic oscillators are very accurate and have exceptional stability. There are different types of atomic oscillators based on the different elements and techniques used. In general, their calibrated free-running accuracy is better than a few parts per trillion. They may gain or lose a few picoseconds every second. But, that can still be further improved. Yes, frequency sources with accuracies around 10 parts per trillion are very good. But not good enough for modern telecommunication technologies, such as 4G LTE Advanced or 5G TDD mobile networks. So, a technique to make them more accurate, stable, and predictable is required. For this, we take advantage of the very expensive and highly accurate network of atomic clocks already built into all major global navigation satellite systems. We use them as references to correct any remaining frequency inaccuracies in our local oscillators and achieve even greater accuracies and long-term stability. This process is called disciplining. It starts with an atomic oscillator. Field applications and portable test and measurement equipment use miniature or chip-scale atomic clocks, based on rubidium or cesium elements. A precision timing-oriented GNSS receiver is added to extract the standard 1 PPS time pulse from GPS, GLONASS, Galileo or Beidou satellite constellations. This accurate 1 PPS is used as a reference to measure the oscillator's frequency, as it defines the exact length of a second. The actual 1 PPS pulse does have some small short-term time error variations or wander, but we can deal with that. A frequency measurement circuit is added. We can represent this with a digital counter driven by the 10 MHz signal. The rising edge of the 1 PPS is used to store the count and reset the counter every second. Now we can count how many cycles there are in one second, and that is the definition of frequency. Next, the reading from the frequency counter gets compared to the expected ideal value. In this case, exactly 10 million cycles. One big advantage is that this reference is digital. It is just a number, and that never changes. If the oscillator is producing 10 million in 10 cycles per second, we can see that the error is plus 10. That means it is running too fast. 
This error value get fed to the oscillator control system, and it applies a proportional correction to the oscillator, to slow it down. The oscillator then lowers its frequency, but it is overcorrected. The new frequency output is measured again, and we get a minus 1 Hz error. This new reading gets fed back to the control system, which then instructs the oscillator to increase its frequency a little bit. Now it is getting close. The new smaller error is used to apply an even smaller correction, to slightly slow down the oscillator and take care of such small difference. It measures again to find an error very close to zero. That means, it is converging towards the desired ideal 10 MHz frequency output. If it keeps on repeating and refining the correction process every second, it will end up with a frequency inaccuracy very close to zero. But, that assumes that the oscillator system, including the oven, sensors and other components react instantaneously, and that is not true. So, we would be applying new corrections every second, while the system is still adjusting to previous corrections. What if instead of making immediate corrections, based on the last sample, some statistical intelligence is added to the system to smooth out the process and allow for finer tuning of the oscillator? Working with multiple samples can help in identifying trends, take the dynamics of the system into account, as well as temperature variations and other factors, to understand the system's behavior and end up with a more smooth and stable frequency output. This statistical process is controlled in part by the time constant, which is a very important parameter that affects the behavior of the system and the quality of its output. The appropriate time constant value depends mainly on the target application, the environment, and the quality of the one PPS reference being used. Shorter time constants will certainly converge faster, as it makes it easier for the system to change its frequency or steer faster. The downside is that it may not be able to filter the short-term errors caused by GNSS 1 PPS phase noise. That would translate into wander at the 10 MHz output. Longer time constants make the system generate smoother corrections and behavior more accurate and stable frequency output with less wander. It helps filter any phase jitter coming from the 1 PPS reference variations. This is good for long-term measurements, but the convergence process will take longer to lock. Which should not be an issue for long-term always-on systems. At the end, we get the most accurate and stable 10 MHz signal possible. That is, a primary frequency reference clock, or PRC. Now that we know how an accurate frequency source is produced, let's focus on the process of generating a 1 PPS time reference signal with its rising edge or phase aligned to the standard second. That is, produce a reliable, accurate and stable primary timing and time reference clock source, or PRTC. People often use rubidium clock as a generic term, as if there was only one type of rubidium clock, or if they were all of the same quality. Something similar happens with cesium clocks. In reality, there are big expensive accurate atomic clocks, and there are small and miniature atomic clocks with certain compromises. So, CS or RB are not enough to describe atomic clocks, we must refer to their specifications to understand the clocks we are using. In modern precision timing applications we don't just use oscillators, we use clocks. Many miniature rubidium oscillators don't have built-in discipline loops, so one has to be built around them to make a clock. In some cases the quality of the oscillator could be overshadowed by a poor disciplining loop design or lack thereof. The big advantage of an integrated or built-in disciplining loop is that it lives inside the oscillator enclosure, experiences the same environment as the oscillator and can monitor it directly. For those of you interested in comparing the free-running specs of two common miniature atomic clock models, you may pause here to take a look. The one on the left uses built-in disciplining to significantly improve its resulting clock quality. In earlier examples, we focused on generating accurate and stable frequency signals. Now, we will focus on precisely aligning timing pulses, so they all represent accurate time by signaling the beginning of the standard second, and good timing by providing the exact duration of a second. For this, we will have to purposely vary the oscillator's frequency in order to control the phase of the output and eliminate any time error. Let's illustrate this with a practical example. We will use one small GPS clock. This will be our one PPS standard reference. 
The rising edge of this pulse indicates the beginning of a new second all over the world. This is a signal generator, acting as a controllable oscillator, and I will be acting as its frequency control system. We have one oscilloscope, showing the 1 PPS standard reference on the top, and the oscillator's output at the bottom. There is also a VXTX340S test set, measuring and recording the phase error or time error variations. At the moment, you can see that the oscillator's pulse is very stable. That means, their frequencies are in sync. But, it is to the right of the 1 PPS reference. That means, it arrived a bit late compared to the standard second. This is called a negative time error. When the pulse happens earlier than the standard second, it would show to the left of the 1 PPS reference. In those cases, we say that there is a positive time error. Now, for a time-oriented disciplining system, the main focus is eliminating any time error. So, contrary to the earlier frequency-oriented examples, the phase alignment system will change the oscillator's frequency to adjust the pulse's position. Higher frequencies move the pulse to the left. The larger the frequency offset is, the faster the pulse's phase moves. Lower frequencies move the pulse to the right. So, the phase alignment control system, or disciplining loop, will continue to adjust the frequency until it aligns the pulse with the edge of standard second and then keeps them aligned. That is, no more time error. Back to the drawing board. Let's build a simplified functional diagram of a precision reference time clock, or PRTC. The main building block of a good PRTC is a high-quality OCXO, or an atomic oscillator. If a 10 million counter is added to the output of the oscillator, it will generate an overflow pulse every time it rolls over from 9,999,999 to zero. For a 10 MHz signal, that pulse will happen once a second. That would be a good timing signal, but not yet a time signal since it is still free-running, and this arbitrary 1 PPS is not aligned in any way to the standard second. If a standard 1 PPS reference from GNSS is added, we can see how inaccurate our arbitrary 1 PPS is. The time between the rising edges of these two pulses is the time error, or TE. Some adjustments would still be required. Similar to what we did for frequency, a phase error measurement element is added. The error data is processed and fed back to the control system. Just like we saw in the lab experiment, the oscillator frequency is deliberately changed to adjust the relative phase and reduce the time error. The disciplining process runs continuously, improving its finesse, while the time error converges to zero and we end up with an accurate time reference. How fast the convergence process is depends on certain disciplining parameters, the initial error, initial frequency inaccuracy, and the quality of the reference signal. With the basic block diagram covered, let's focus on two important parameters that determine how the clock behaves. They are the time constant and the phase error threshold. The two form the disciplining window. These two parameters are used to declare when the clock has reached the desired levels of stability and accuracy, or locked state. That is, accurate, stable, and ready to use. The first one is the tolerable relative phase error threshold. It basically defines the minimum required target accuracy in nanoseconds. For example, if the reference is a high-precision multiband GNSS receiver, we could set it to declare a lock when it stabilizes within 20 nanoseconds from its reference. The second parameter is the time constant. It defines the desired stability constraints of the 1 PPS output, and it also affects the oscillator's behavior. This value is specified in seconds. The longer the time constant is, the more stringent the stability requirement gets. Longer time constants also make the oscillator hard to steer, which can help in achieving better long-term stability goals. The two parameters form a box or sliding window, in which the last X number of internal time error measurements have to fit into. Only when they do, the discipline is considered successful and locked. Nonetheless, the evaluation continues. The disciplining process is divided into two main parts, acquisition and lock. The acquisition is the initial phase alignment of the 1 PPS output with the reference input. 
Then the locked stage tries to maintain the clock accuracy over time. Basically, the box or disciplining window defines how much phase drift or difference at the input would be tolerated over a period of time, before triggering a new acquisition to force a realignment of the output 1 pps to the input reference. The idea is to define a disciplining window that keeps the atomic clock in lock state and avoids triggering reacquisitions. Phase realignments are not good for test and measurement applications. The typical life of a PRTC is a stationary one, spent bolted to a rack in a lab, equipment room, or container, and never to be turned off. So, if the initial disciplining process takes several hours or days, it doesn't matter much, since it is only done once. People in charge of them most likely understand the potential clock quality benefits of a long time constant and stringent threshold. For field applications, like test and measurement, we have to go over the disciplining process every time we arrive to a new site and need an accurate and stable clock reference. So, choosing the right window becomes very important. The decision should be based on the application and the test equipment must allow users to see and change those settings. In field test and measurement applications, there is always the temptation for a quick discipline cycle, in the name of practicality. It is understandable, since we don't have all day, and compromises may need to be consciously made. Unfortunately, some vendors may use very short time constants and high error thresholds to claim fastest disciplining as an advantage. You should be suspicious when the time constant or the time error thresholds are hidden, as they may be a hint of poor clock quality. You should be the one making these choices, based on the application and the environment. One criteria to define the appropriate window is to know the quality of the raw signal coming from the GNSS receiver. Different types of 1 PPS references have different clock quality. General purpose GPS only receiver offer poor short term and long term stability, so the oscillator has to work very hard to try maintaining a constant output and produce accurate timing. Since they may suffer from large day-night phase fluctuations, we would recommend a relative time error thresholds of around 100 nanoseconds. Timing-oriented GNSS receivers use location survey to eliminate wander caused by changes in coordinates, producing a more stable signal. For this we could recommend 50 nanoseconds. Multiband GNSS receivers take it a bit further by tuning into multiple frequencies from all constellations and produce a cleaner 1 PPS reference signal. This makes it easier for the atomic clock to follow and quicker to discipline. For this, we would recommend values around 20 to 50 nanoseconds. We have mentioned that the time constant can also change the steering and filtering abilities of an oscillator. These illustrations depict a worst-case type of scenario with variable timing references typical of general-purpose GPS-only receivers and what would happen with the output for different time constant selections. The illustrations on the left represent the phase error or time error variations from the raw GPS-1 PPS output. On the right, these are the time error variation at the output of the disciplined oscillator. If the time constant is too small, the oscillator will be very agile, and it would just follow the source. Unfortunately, this just filters the short-term phase jitter. Longer time constants would make the oscillator's frequency harder to steer, and that makes its output more stable. But the disciplining process will take longer to lock. There is always a trade-off between convenience and quality, so choose wisely, based on your application requirements and test environment. The cleaner and more stable the timing reference input is, the lower the time constant that can be used. A high-quality multiband GNSS receiver would allow you to use shorter time constants, discipline faster and obtain better outputs. Here are some suggestions based on the quality of the 1 PPS reference input and expected test time. Longer tests, like measuring long-term clock stability over multiple days, would require longer time constant and more stable inputs. In this training we will focus on the actual operation of the test set, its configuration, settings, process, and tips to perform phase alignment and eliminating time error in VX test sets. That is, how to generate a clean and stable internal 1 PPS timing reference signal that is aligned to the standard second and can be used to synchronize 1588 PTP emulation or to measure time error, wander, or one-way delay. 
As mentioned in previous sessions, most of the information and material available about sync and timing are based on lab applications and experiences. In lab environments you have trusted and verified reference signals, and all sort of instruments to monitor and confirm the health of such references. For field applications, on the other hand, your single instrument has to be very resourceful and provide as much information as possible about the worthiness of its local references. Let us show you some of these important tools. Some of VX test sets offer different ways to discipline their internal atomic clocks. Normally, we use the optional built-in GNSS receiver option, although some allow external cleaner 1 PPS reference signals from a PRTC. We will continue to focus on the GNSS receiver. For this guided example, we will use a TX300S test platform with high-precision multi-band GNSS receiver and built-in atomic clock options. Now, let us show you how to configure and discipline a VX test set. From any screen, tap on the System Tools button. Select Utilities. Settings. More. GPS and High Precision Clock. On the GNSS tab, make sure the receiver is on. We can see that there are plenty of satellites with good signal quality, with carrier to noise above 40 dB Hz. That is good. On the Status tab, let's confirm it has finished its location survey. Locked means it is in precision timing mode. Refer to the GNSS receiver configuration video for more details. Now, select the Atomic Clock tab. On the right side, check that the atomic oscillator is locked. That means, it has warmed up, passed its self-check, and it is running at its natural frequency. At the bottom, you should see a status icon with a green wave indicating it is a trusted free-running frequency source. On the left, verify that the 1 PPS reference signal status is marked as valid. The first important thing to know is the quality of the reference 1 PPS signal being fed to the atomic clock. This will depend on multiple factors, like, type of GNSS receiver, type of antenna, antenna position, and satellite signal quality. First, enable disciplining by selecting the reference source. Let's use GNSS 1 PPS. We recommend performing a quick check procedure to learn how the system is working under the current conditions. Set the discipline mode to custom. Enter a time constant of 30 or 60 seconds and press apply. We will be using 10 seconds in this example to speed up the process. Then, open the phase graph monitor window. This is a relative time error measurement between the atomic clock's 1 PPS output and its 1 PPS reference input. In general, at the beginning of the disciplining process, or acquisition, it shows how well the atomic clock timing is aligning with the time reference. Since the output of the atomic clock is very smooth, and it has very little noise, the differences shown in this graph also allow us to see the phase noise from the GNSS reference. Let's look at an input versus output diagram for a worst case example from a typical GPS only receiver. On the left, there is the long term time error wander from a GPS 1 PPS. It shows some day night variations. On the right, we have the steady output of the disciplined atomic clock. The resulting phase graph shows the second-by-second -second relative phase error between the two. With good satellite reception, a GPS-only receiver will be around plus or minus 30 nanoseconds. A dual constellation GNSS receiver should be around plus minus 10 nanoseconds, and a precision multiband GNSS receiver would be less than 5 nanoseconds. If you happen to be using an external 1 PPS reference signal from a PRTC, then the short-term phase noise should be close to zero. Let the signal converge to zero, and then zoom in to get an idea of the peak-to-peak -peak magnitude of the short-term phase variations coming from the raw GNSS 1 PPS source. In this case, it seems to be less than 10 nanoseconds. We will use this information to help determine the short-term relative time error threshold that should be used. Remember, the relative time error threshold is the maximum phase drift allowed during a time constant period, before the system is forced back into acquisition mode, to realign its output pulse. Now that you have an idea of the short-term quality of the raw input reference, you should set the threshold accordingly. 
So, add some extra margin to allow for some changes in the GNSS1 PPS. Let's use 50 nanoseconds. Next, complete the settings for the discipline window by selecting the appropriate time constant and let the system do its job. Since this test set has a high precision multiband GNSS receiver and a good antenna, let's use a time constant of 900 seconds. We will show a reference table later on. Keep in mind that the relative phase error must remain within the time window for the length of a time constant, so the whole process will first take the time required to converge to zero and then stay below the phase error threshold for the duration of a time constant before it declares discipline lock. On the right side of the bottom status bar, you will find the atomic clock status icon. It provides detailed clock status and it stays visible at all times. An orange misaligned pulse indicates that disciplining is in progress. Here is a quick reference guide for the detailed atomic clock disciplining status icon, which is always visible at the bottom right corner of the screen. The bottom three are the most important ones when working with time error measurements. A green pulse indicates that accurate 1 PPS is available, and a warning sign indicates the clock is in holdover. If at some point you want to force the atomic clock into holdover, turn the GNSS receiver off. Once you get the discipline lock status, you may start using the atomic 1 PPS and atomic 10 MHz selections in any test application that requires highly accurate and stable clock reference. For example, PTP time error measurements, phase error measurements, long-term stability or wander, one-way delay, etc. You are all set. Here are some generic recommendations for setting time windows, depending on applications. Remember, there is always a trade-off between convenience and quality, so choose wisely, based on your application requirements and test environment. Longer tests, like measuring long-term clock stability over multiple days, would require longer time constant and more stable inputs. Thank you for watching this training session. We hope we have shined some light into the sometimes obscure world to timing and synchronization. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact us. If you found this video useful, please like it, subscribe to our channels and share it with your colleagues.